Hi, we're going to finish the remaining of our Chapter 17 lecture, Closing the Frontier. Uh, remember a few, a uh, little recap of what we've done before uh, this lecture. Again, that was the last West and the New South. Uh, we talked about the Great Plains and how the Great Plains was the last American, really, American desert. Uh, we went into the railroads and the importance of the railroads in the West and, of course, uh, being subsidized by these large land grants from the government. Uh, we did talk about the mining frontier and the massive amount of Americans moving westward to get those mining jobs. Again, mostly um, it was in the west, in the California, Nevada, uh, Colorado area to start with, then moved into places like uh, South Dakota and Idaho and Arizona as well. Uh, again, the stereotype is that all these miners were these, you know, these prospectors making it rich. It really wasn't the reality. Most miners were in the ground. Uh, not making very much money, extremely dangerous jobs in the, these, these boom towns like Virginia City. Uh, also, we have the Cal Frontier, where we see large amounts of cal being driven from the low parts of Texas into the rail links of Kansas. And um, again, a lot of diversity on these uh, drives. You see a lot of Mexicans, a lot of African Americans also partaking in that. Eventually, the cal drives will be coming to an end with uh, the homesteading of the plains and also a bit with barbed wire, thus fencing off large tracts of land. And then we also talked about the farming frontier, uh, the mass amounts of Americans moving westward to Homestead, uh, with two big acts, the Homestead Act and the Moral Land Grant Act, both uh, providing uh, either free or very cheap land to uh, Westerners. Uh, they gave them very much woods, they had to build sod houses, and a very hard time there. Most farmers actually didn't make it over two-thirds, actually sold their farms or went bankrupt and moved back east, uh, either due to lar large droughts or unstable crop prices, railroad monopolies, uh, predatory banks, you know, very little political pull as well. Uh, and then now we're going to talk about the closing the frontier. So by in the 1880s, pretty much the only last area that had not been inhabited by white settlers was Oklahoma. And so in 1889, the federal government opened up the Oklahoma Territory for one last land rush. Uh, they sort of moved Native Americans into the reservation system by then, and either in Oklahoma or the Dakotas mostly. And at that point, the Census Bureau will claim that the frontier was now closed, with pretty much all the arable land or the available land to be settled had been settled already. Obviously, there's going to be lots of land that was still unsettable, the uh, middle of deserts, high mountain tops, stuff like that. But all the land that was settable was settled. Um, economist uh, Frederick uh, Turner, and what he wrote was that his thesis was that America was born on the backs of always having land available. It shaped the American experience. And by that means that there was always land available for, for growth, uh, for the government, but also individually. Basically, anyone could be born uh, into a poor class or come over here as an immigrant and then still have the advantage of potentially always be a landowner. Well, now with the frontier closed and basically America not having that massive amount of land available for anyone who wants it, it was going to be a dis distinctly different America going forward. Um, Again, the thought was that America would fall into the same pathway or same fate as Europe that basically had a uh, closed system where the land had already been sort of divided up. Eventually, America, because of this, we are going to expand across our borders and outside our borders to places like Hawaii and Alaska, Cuba, um, Philippines, Puerto Rico, Guam, and other places like that by the late 1890s. And what allowed this frontier to be closed is pretty much the massive creation and expansion of the railroad industry with uh, pretty much railroads uh, uh, linking pretty much all, all the parts of the American continent into those large markets of the East Coast. In the West, there's also the Native Americans. So uh, as the Americans were expanding you know, uh, through homesteads and mining and ranches, they were basically taking different Native American tribes' land away from them. Um, most Native Americans will actually voluntarily move to the reservation system, with some of them actually uh, requiring the U.S. Cavalry Army coming in and forcibly removing or going to war against them to finally remove. 
Uh, three big groups. We have the Pueblo groups in New Mexico, Arizona, Hopi and Zuni. You have the Southwest tribes of Navajo and Apache. These are warrior tribes, more nomadic. Then you have also the Great Plains tribes of Sioux, Blackfoot, Cheyenne, and Crow. These were very nomadic tribes as well. Okay, the importance of the buffalo on these tribes was huge. And one thing that the American government and also the people did to decimate not only the Native Americans, but the buffaloes, was actually to kill the buffaloes off. The buffaloes were such an integral part of Native Americans' lifestyle. Uh, they used for clothes and food, teepees for their, basically their dwellings, uh, buffalo just for heat, the tendons of the buffalo for their bowstrings, uh, buffalo bones uh, were used for knives and ornaments and even arrowheads in a pinch. So one way to get the natives to be reliant on the reservation was to basically make sure that the Native Americans had no big game animal to hunt and to nomadically move around with. So the decline of Native Americans also came at the same time, of course, with the policy of the American government for the reservation concentration policy. Basically, it was the government pushing Native Americans into large reservation systems, mostly in Oklahoma and South Dakota, but really across the West. And you're going to see the decimation of the buffalo as one key aspect or element of this, where they were going to be a systematic slaughter of the buffalo through all sorts of capacities. And to get those last tribes into the reservation, there had to be a series of Indian wars uh, or Native American wars. And again, this was going to be in due to increased encroachment. Uh, Native Americans did start fighting back a little bit towards uh, you know, American miners or ranchers or homesteaders. Again, it was very much a small scale. Most of the violence took place on, from the white side onto the natives, but there was some Native uh, wars as well. So to get the natives to submit, the cavalry and the army were, were sent to push them into the reservation system. And most went on the side of the army. One instance where the army was actually ambushed and, and uh, killed was the uh, Custer's Last Stand, where a Sitting Bull and the Sioux Warriors had clashed with George Colonel Custard at the Battle of Bighorn. Um, and pretty much this was a, a, a war or a massacre that happened because Custer was overconfident himself. Uh, he actually wanted to go in for the kill and the co conquering this tribe without waiting for backup to basically guard his flanks. Uh, so he went in and the Native Americans were able to surround him, ambush him, and kill most of the cavalry units. So one of the very few victories for the Native Americans. Uh, the Nez Pierce, uh, with Chief Joseph, will actually, rather than going to the reservation system, will flee on a 1,500-mile journey that will take them, basically all looping around and trying to get up to Canada. Eventually, they will surrender and then be removed to the reservation in 1877. Uh, the Geronimo and the Apache will actually um, basically hold himself into the Arizona desert and canyons for several years. Uh, again, you'll elude um, uh, cavalry and make raids on towns and settlers and passerbyers. Eventually, he will surrender in 1886. Probably the most famous of the Indian Wars was the Massacre of Wounded Knee. Well, the U.S. Army had outlawed that ghost dance. And they basically had came in and they killed the, the, the main spiritual chief, Sitting Bull. And they also killed over 200 American Native Americans, uh, were gunned down, mostly unarmed uh, women and children, with some men as well, but mostly women, children, or unarmed men. And pretty much it was a massacre. But again, it was in history books, in many cases called the Battle of Wounded Knee, but the more appropriate would be the Massacre of Wounded Knee. And that pretty much closed. Native American aggression out. Uh, at that time, all Native American tribes had sort of submitted and gone to the reservation system. Uh, Americans at the same time, some Americans at least, started to sort of, um, sort of try to speak up and stand up for Native Americans. One such woman was Helen Hunt Jackson. She wrote the book called The Century of Dishonor, basically a whole hundred years of basically American history from the starting of the Constitution up into the 1880s. 
of Americans' just habitual mistreatment of natives, which will then be spurred into new Native American policy that will be passed by Congress. Um, the Indian, Indian, uh, the Office of Indian Affairs will push for a new law called the Dawes Act. Again, this was an act that was actually intended to help natives, but did the reverse, actually really hurt the natives. And what it did, it gave, basically broke up the reservation system and giving 160 acres to each head of family on the reservation. Again, trying to like, sorry, I guess put more uh, white v American values of land ownership and farming into the natives rather than group collective work. In the end, it was terrible because since it was in private hands now, private Native American individuals could now sell that land off. And typically they were swindled by whites who selling off huge chunks of land at pennies on the dollar, uh, basically um, thus taking more Native American land and putting it into white hands. And pretty much what we have here is the last remaining Native American reservations. You see big blocks in Arizona and New Mexico, big blocks in, in the Dakotas and Montanas and the West, and there's still some pretty decent sized chunks in Oklahoma as well. But pretty much we see almost a void of any Native American uh, um, reservation or settlement east of the Mississippi River. Also, we had a, a, a small number of Hispanics in the West. Uh, their number is probably less than 100,000. Um, most were uh, either the former rancheros of California or some of the ex um, Hispanics who lived in the Santa Fe area or the Texas area. Uh, but again, a very small number of group. Uh, most of them uh, were working class. Some were landowners, but most worked in the mines or worked on the ranches, worked as cattle uh, uh, runners. And again, by the 1900s, a lot of these Hispanics had become basically pushed into the working class group where their, their skills and talents were taken away and they were forced into more menial type of work. Okay, we also see the conservation movement, really our first true conservation movement uh, in the West. Uh, we're going to see John Muir, a uh, naturalist who will actually push to create uh, the Sierra Club, uh, who will be a big proponent of saving these national treasures, these, these landscapes of the West. He was enamored by California and the huge sequoias of the Sierra Nevadas and this park or this, this area called Yosemite. Um, he went there, he you know, wanted to uh, claim it as a natural preserve, and he got Congress to make Yosemite their first national park in 1872. Uh, the second one will be Yellowstone. I think that was in the early 1870s as well, or mid-1870s as well. There's Yosemite Falls and El Capitan. And also we see the pushing of the romance of the West. Um, we're going to see a lot of artists and writers really start using the West as a stage for their artistic endeavors. And again, America was eating up. America wanted to know more about the West. They were enamored by it. They, they, they had West fever. Um, so this fell right into line about that. So the Rocky Mountain School was this, a art school of thought and ideology about just sort of the style of painting, very similar to the Hudson River School like 40 years before. Uh, you see Albert Berkstead, Thomas Moran um, were two of the big painters. Also, many of the railroads also paid these artists to draw big murals for their train stations and, and postcards and mailers and other things to promote people wanting to use the train system, the railways, to get out west. You also see the railways starting to build these large, um, um, I can't the word, these large uh, hotels, like there's a ch chateaus and uh, lodges across the West. So you see a huge amounts of like, lodges being built like in Crater Lake, Oregon, and the Rocky Mountains, and Montana, and other places to get to lure tourists into the nature area by the railroads. So here's some of the pictures of Berks and Moran. Beautiful. Uh, Samuel Clemens, or Mark Twain, he was a writer. He also wrote about the West himself. Again, um, not so much about the West, but a lot of his stories sort of took place as a, you know, as the ruggedness of the east of the Mississippi River, you know, crowd. 
Um, probably the most famous one of his was Huckleberry Finn or Tom Sawyer, really romanticizing that spirit, that freedom, the, you know, and the, the, the unknown a little bit. He had the artist, sculptor, and painter, Frederick Remington, who idealized the West in his statue and his paintings. Um, typically, most presidents will have one of these statues in their White House, uh, in one of their rooms. And you also see um, the Buffalo Bill Cody created this Wild West show that he toured the country with to sort of show the country what the West was all about. Like, and of course, it was a very stereotypical, very realistic um, West, too. Uh, he you know, brought in a, you know, the Native Americans' little village that he would uh, set up. Uh, he brought in Native Americans. They had cowboys, and they would like, wrangle uh, They would wrangle. Uh, steers and do horse back riding things they would do gun tricks and stuff like that um, there's he is and they even brought their show to europe as well because again it was like you know we seen it was seen as very american this western this western land there's annie oakley the fastest gun in the west uh, we also start seeing uh, our really big first anti-immigration laws being passed uh, in the west Again, nationally, but the West started. Um, the Chinese were seen as a very anti-American group. Uh, again, they worked the mines, they worked the railroads, they worked agriculture. And they were very different than white-born or white Americans. Uh, and so Americans didn't really understand them. They didn't really accept their culture. They were threatened by also the Chinese willingness to work for really low wages. Uh, so at the very start, they passed laws to like limit uh, different uh, groups, Chinese or sometimes Hispanics, within different regions of, of working. Uh, they had anti-coolie clubs that organized and banned Chinese labor in San Francisco and other western areas. Eventually, the national government is going to pass the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And what that can do is pretty much ban all Chinese immigration. Um, and it also will eventually uh, tack on Japanese immigration as well later on. Here's a famous Thomas Nast cartoon where you see Lady Columbia protecting the Chinese woman, again, from these barbarians over there. Uh, again, you look, look really close, you see sort of the Lucky Charm getup, you know, the Irish getup. So these Irish were very upset at the Chinese because, again, the Chinese was now going to come in and, and accept wages lower than even the Irish would accept. And so what Thomas Nast is saying is that basically all men and immigrants should be created and treated equally and given the same opportunity. So this is where we actually see an anti-nativist cartoon. Where exact opposite here, you see a very nativist cartoon. Um, you know, again, but not in the way of promoting nativism, but highlighting it. Sort of highlighting the nativism that we see here. Um, and a very sort of anti, anti-nativist ideology here though. Thomas Nast was actually trying to show the problems of natives in this time period. You see the minor, you know, basically riding the Chinese person uh, like you would a horse. Here's a reverse one where actually you do see a cartoon that is very negative towards the Chinese and Irish. And the threat is that they're gonna basically eat up American, there's Uncle Sam here, eat up American culture, American ideology, and eventually the Chinese will win out. Okay, eventually we're gonna have major farm problems. Uh, and again, not just on the smaller scale with the homestead. That's going to be a big problem too. But also on even larger scales too. So one big thing was changes in agriculture. Farming becoming more commercialized, more mechanized. Um, it's going to really drive out all these small scale farmers. Um, also falling farm prices due to increased surplus. And again, Europe uh, providing more of its own crops uh, will cause prices to fall which is gonna cause more farmers to produce more goods, causing prices of farm even more. And then, you'll, of course, you have the rising cost of railroads um, and rising cost of manufactured goods where farmers relied on. So farmers will finally start to fight back. Again, starting in the Old West, which is like Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, Missouri, places like that, where certain groups are going to start coming together, you know, farm groups, and, call, and create something called the Grange. And the Grange is basically a, a grouping of farmers that are going to 
pool their crops, pool their seeds, pool their money to then gain more leverage when it comes to pricing. So instead of having each farmer buy their own seed, they're going to pool their money and buy seed in one lot, thus bringing down the cost. When farmers need to ship, rather than each shipping individually, they're going to basically pool their grain or pool their crops and then ship in bulk, reducing the shipping prices. Um, and they're going to start lobbying in their states to regulate the railroads, to help them out and officially re regulate these railroad companies. So many states, um, and we're going to use Illinois as an example because they're actually going to be in the court system, will start to make laws to regulate railroad rates, which again is great for farmers. Uh, basically, there's laws that fix prices, um, and basically it made it illegal for railroads to just say, nope, uh, price for shipping is this much regardless of, of uh, supply and demand, stuff like that. They're going to make it illegal for railroads to give rebates to privileged customers, basically kickbacks, making their rates uh, less less expensive than the other ones. And they're even going to pass the law. Um, and when this law is going to be fought in court by the railroad companies, and they're going to the railroad companies are going to lose this law. So Munn versus Illinois is a Supreme Court case that that upheld the Grange laws. So Munn versus Illinois was a win for farmers. Make sure you put that back there. Make sure you put that down there. A win for farmers. The Supreme Court ruled that basically the railroads had no right to complain, that the, these Granger laws were constitutional. And of course, railroads will start to fight back because, again, they want to maximize their profits as much as possible. So the railroad later on, a few years later, you see the dates. This is 77. This is 86. The railroad will eventually will sue again. Uh, and again, Wabash is a railroad company. And they're going to sue the state of Illinois. And they have a new way to sue. The thought is that they can't say these laws are unconstitutional. But what they can say is that since railroads do not operate solely in one state, they actually are interstate companies or interstate commerce, that only the federal government has the right to regulate those rates, not individual states. So if there was a, a railroad that only operated in one state, then the state could regulate them through Granger laws. But since most of the railroads were, were interstate companies, which means they operated in many, many states, that only the federal government could regulate their rates. And actually, the Supreme Court agreed with that with the basis from Gibbons versus Ogden, uh, using that precedent way back when as a precedent for this one. So if the government's going to regulate railroad rates, they need to have a, a basically a commission to do so. Hence, the Interstate Commerce Act, which created the Interstate Commerce Commission, which will actually start regulating the railroads. The problem is, is that they actually will help the railroads out. This Interstate Commerce Commission will actually do things to actually help proceed the railroads hold and not actually help the farmers themselves. So that's actually reverse. Eventually, about 20 years later, the president, Theodore Roosevelt, is going to start enforcing these laws. But for the time being, we're going to see that these laws really hurt individuals. You know, you see the all this train running over the individuals there. You see the farmers trying to fight back. But again, the railroad has uh, its tail wrapped around Congress, where the really farmers have no chance. So the farmers start to get political. Uh, they're going to start not only be uh, fed form economic granges, but they're also going to take those, those connections and move to the political stage. Um, so they're going to they're form, starting to form national parties and national alliances to have a weight politically as well as economically. Uh, one person who's going to be very inspirational with these farm alliances is a woman named Mary Lease. Her famous quote, like someone who was raised less corn and more hell. Okay, so many farmers will meet down in Florida, in Ocala, and at this Farmers Alliance convention, they are going to address the problems of rural America, especially the problems of farmers, and they're going to attack both the Democrats and Republicans, saying that both parties really had no interest in, in looking into what farmers' needs were, or the rural Americans' needs were. So the main idea for the uh, platform was that you, we should have a direct election of senators, which means that we should have the people vote for them. We should lower tariffs across the board. 
Uh, we should have a graduate income tax. We should have a new banking system. And we should have a national currency rather than based on gold, based on silver. And eventually they're going to form the Populist Party, which we'll talk to more about in Chapter 19. But this new party is going to run two national elections and many state elections. And actually in one election, 1892, they're going to win several states. They, have, they win Kansas, Colorado, Nevada, Idaho, and the parts of Oregon and parts of North Dakota. Actually getting them a pretty good chunk for a, a small third party. And that's it. That's for lecture. Basically we have monkey... Uh, on a dog, crazy monkey, and old monkey, and nerdy monkey. Okay. Um, awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, we will have uh, some quizzes on this a little bit later, but make sure you watch this, take notes on this in Monday's class, and be prepared to ask me some questions, and um, be, be prepared to answer some short answer questions or even a long essay regarding this chapter on Tuesday. Have a great day, guys.